Hello, and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, a proud part of the Wander Barn Podcast Network. I'm Ryan. I'm Amanda. And we're your hosts. We're a traveling couple and digital nomads taking you on our adventures as we explore locations, destinations, and careers. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the World Wanderers Podcast. Today, we are very excited to be doing a catch-up, and this is going to set a record for the longest uh, time in between first and second interviews, but very excited to have Gabriel Weiner here with us to talk about language learning. He was probably one of our first guest interviews on, on the show ever back in June of 2015, um, and time has flown past, and um, we've been doing lots of language learning and thought it would be a great, great opportunity to catch up with Gabriel, to find out more about Fluent Forever, uh, and to talk about language learning again, because I think it's always relevant in the life of a traveler. So Gabriel is the creator of Fluent Forever, which is now an app. I know you guys run workshops as well, the author of a book with the same name, and has a ton of experience, is a polyglot um, with language learning and a former opera singer as well. So a fascinating background, and Gabriel, very excited to catch up. They're really excited to be here. And yeah, seven years, crazy. <laughs> and so the first thing we always like to ask on the show is where in the world are you joining us from? I am in Chicago, which I guess was not the case seven years ago. So yeah, that is that's, that was right before I moved. Yeah. If I remember correctly, you were in California, right? Yep. Yep. I had moved back from uh, Austria to Los Angeles and then yeah, in 2016 moved over to Chicago. And how's life treating you in uh, further north outside of the beautiful California weather. <laughs> I, I love it here. I mean, I feel like uh, the, 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 the standard like hobby of someone living in Chicago is to complain about the weather, but like, I just, this is a beautiful city with really wonderful people. So I've been, I've been digging it here the whole time. Yeah. I feel like that's very Canadian in style too, where it's like, we're complaining, but we're also proud. Like, Oh, it's like negative 40. You're like, it's the second coldest part of the world here. Like, <laughs> Calgary is the second coldest city in the world today. Like it's a kind of a bad thing, but kind of a nice thing. I mean, I remember being, being warned for a year, like for a solid year of like, you're going to die. You're going to die. Like, it's just the what you're not going to make it through the winter. And then I went through my first winter and it was fine. It's actually, it was relatively mild. And they were like, well, that didn't count. And then uh, the next time out, they were like, this is the polar vortex. So you're going to get negative 40. And all of the Chicagoans were like hiding indoors. And I'm like, no, let's make snowmen. Like I've never, when do you get to get exposed to that kind of like intensity? Like this is cool. Um, and I was the only one outside. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think as humans, we, we get so accustomed. We are kind of experiencing the opposite now that we've been skipping winter for so long the other day it dropped here to like 19 celsius um i was cold and we we're like huddled up like freezing i'm like, like oh God. i gotta like pull a sweater out of the closet like the depths of the closet <laughs> like what is happening um but i thought a, a cool place to start might be to just talk about how your business has evolved over the past couple of years um but i think the last time we talked it was just kind of in those initial starts um you'd raised kickstarters for different language um, I can't remember if it was like uh, kind of learning decks. And then obviously you've launched an app, you've done a bunch of crowdfunding. Um, would you mind walking us through that? Sure. Happy to. Um, so let's see, we chatted in 2015, which was, I guess, after the Kickstarter had completely finished the first Kickstarter. Um, and so at that point I was attempting to raise 10,000 bucks to make, I think like 12 pronunciation trainers. Um, which were like Anki decks that would, you know, teach people the difference between, let's say, you know, doma and toma, like these kind of DT just differences in Spanish, but just spread across all these languages. Um, that one ended up raising like ninety five thousand bucks. Uh, we ended up promising sixty five products, and like at that point, I was on this road of like, okay, I need to make all this stuff. Um, and so I finished those in twenty seventeen. Um, it was half of those were pronunciation training decks, like 32 of those, um, or 33 of those. And then I did 32, uh, word lists. These were lists of words that were, uh, like the most frequent words that you'll learn in the language, but visual. So like no ands and, you know, becauses, but lots of, you know, laptop and water and things like that. Um, and they were arranged in groups, uh, that were easier to memorize than the sort of standard let's list all the, you know, fruits and all the colors and all the numbers kind of thing. Um, and so we, we built sort of those, uh, and then by 2017, we basically got a sense from, from our, our users, which at that point were just people 
buying our flashcard decks and, and, and word lists and things that everyone was reading my book and being like, this is cool. I get how this will work. I guess how, I get how this could make me fluent in a language, but the computer side is too hard. Um, you're asking me to use these flashcard tools and go on Google images and find images and go to this text to speech thing and find that. And like, it's just, it's a lot of pieces. Can you just make this easy? Um, and so we launched a Kickstarter in 2017 to fund development of an app. Um, at that time, I was attempting to raise, I guess, 250,000 uh, bucks. That was kind of in midline with the estimates I had of how long, how big it would cost, like how much it would cost to make an app. Um, we ended up raising like $1.7 million. Uh, and I thought, man, like this is going to be easy, not just easy, but like we, we can build all sorts of cool things. Like this is going to be amazing. Um, at this point, in addition to that 1.7 million, we've pulled in about $7 million of investor funds. Um, we have spent the, almost all of that on the app. Uh, our initial estimates of like, oh, it'll range from 250,000 to 600,000 to make this app. Uh, we're off by, I mean, by more than, than an order of magnitude. I mean, we've, we've spent 7 million bucks on this app. <laughs> um, and I would say we are like halfway through in terms of the functionality that I, I, I want ultimately in this thing. Um, so app design is nuts. Like <laughs> it's, it's completely insane. Uh, that said in the process, we've built a, a, a beautiful team of people, um, just, just fabulously talented, smart, wonderful people. Um, we've done really, really cool things with the app and the last year has been dedicated towards, uh, a thing I've kind of always wanted to do all the way through, I guess, since I came up with a method in like 2010, um, which is, is there a way to have a conversation with someone with a native speaker and turn that in, turn that conversation into flashcards. Um, and I don't mean that in like a, like flashcards aren't super sexy, uh, but uh, the, the concept is really like, even in this, this podcast, like we're all going to be chatting and like any of your listeners are going to listen to this thing and they're going to walk away from this conversation with like one to three takeaways. Uh, and that's it. And they don't get a lot of control over what those takeaways are. Like I could just, I don't know, at some point I could like stumble over a word or I could like, I don't know, just hit my microphone or something. And people will be like, Oh, I remember when Gabe hit his microphone and like, that was maybe one of those one to three takeaways. And that could be the whole thing. They could leave with this podcast. And then tomorrow, the only thing they remember is like, man, Gabe just hit his microphone. And that was really weird. And that was it. That's the only thing they learned from that, that entire hour or at half hour, whatever that is. Um, and that happens with native speakers. It happens with every conversation we have. Like we forget most of what we talk about. And so you, you pay all this money for tutoring and stuff, and then you forget it. <laughs> and then you do it again next week. And then you forget it. Um, but if like in this podcast example, like if one of your listeners was, was taking notes and every minute they wrote down like, oh, this is when Gabe was talking about, I don't know, that first Kickstarter. And this is when Gabe was talking about this, you know, their, his, his, his word lists and this was whatever. They're just kind of listing these things out. Um, and then they built flashcards that had some imagery on it. Um, and the imagery is important because it makes you actually remember what, what's happening, not just something abstract, like the word that fills in the blank is blah, blah, blah. Um, and then they looked at those flashcards that evening, and then they looked at it again in a few days, and they looked at it again in a week, and then in three weeks, et cetera. Um, they'd remember everything that happened in this particular podcast. And so that's, don't do that for this podcast. Like <laughs> no one should do that. Like this is for, for entertainment and some feeling of like, oh, I, I learned some new stuff. But um, with a native speaker, like you do want that. You want to remember everything. Like, why would you want to forget a word? Like, that's the, the best possible content. This is content where you have a person talking to you one-on-one -on -one about your life. Like, it's, it's the best possible interaction you can have. And then the idea of forgetting most of that is just, like, painful. And so the thought is, well, can you make it so you can remember everything from a native speaker when you're talking to them? And the last year has been dedicated towards building that, and we've built it. And so uh, I would say the app that we've built from, like, like when we launched that first, the, the second Kickstarter, which was 2017 till when we released it in 2019 till like now-ish, uh, that app is good. Like it's a solid, beautiful app. It does good things. But when you combine that with the idea of like talking to a native speaker and having all of that go into this app experience where it pushes the flashcards out towards you that are all 
customized and all built on pictures you've taken or that you see or all these things. Um, you get this engine where you can talk to a native speaker and that same day you're, you're memorizing everything that you talked about with that native speaker. And then tomorrow you could talk to a native speaker again. And then all that stuff gets pushed into the, into this, this app again, so that you remember everything that happened from yesterday and today. And then the third day happens. You remember everything that happened yesterday, today, and the day before that. Um, and so we're seeing people hit like B2 level fluency in Spanish in like five to eight months uh, without having to do anything. Like they just show up, talk to a native speaker, and then play with their phone. And that's all they're doing. And they're reaching fluency. And it's just, it's everything I wanted it to be um, in terms of like a product that I wanted to build and put out there. Uh, that's, it's been pretty cool. So that's kind of been what we've been up to. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. It's a good uh, high level overview of the last couple of years with your business. And it's cool to hear that people are having such great success. Like I think that getting to that level of Spanish has taken me like God, seven years <laughs> over the last little while. So definitely more than five to eight months. And that's been a lot of the time living in Latin America, taking lessons, et cetera, et cetera. So very cool to hear. And I know we want to get more into language learning, but before we do that, I'm really curious about, you know, just your experience with building an app, running Kickstarters. Obviously, you've had a lot of success with this, but I'm curious, like I know you mentioned that building app, an app was way more expensive than you kind of initially thought. You know, Tell us a little bit more about that process and anything else that maybe surprised you, challenged you, that type of thing. I mean, running a, a tech business is uh, certainly was not what I expected. Um, I mean, the, the amount of time... I think when I showed up in this thing, I was like, cool, we're going to get some money from Kickstarter. We're going to give it to some programmers and we're going to have an app. Right. <laughs> like, and, and like, not right. Like not at all. N none of that. Um, I mean, the, the learning how to play the game of, of professional investment, uh, learning how much time I would need to spend on that thing. Like I would say a good third to half of my time for the last uh, I mean, since 2018, really, when we started like invest uh, involving VCs and angels and stuff like that, um, has been spent on that, like not on product, not on on any of that stuff. It's just spent on on interacting, like networking, talking to investors, updating investors, keeping investors interested, figuring out storytelling for the purposes of investing, and that's that's the majority of my job. I would say that's the most constant thing in my job. Uh, and that has nothing to do with let's get some money and make an app. Like it's, it's just, they're, they're completely different things. Um, I would say if I were to look back on like what my role has become, it's uh, like, I'm a professional storyteller. Uh, it's not that I'm telling, you know, fictions or anything like that. And I'm not, uh, it, you, you have to base everything in, in reality. You have to base everything in data. But the role is, is not product design. The role is storytelling. The role is, I see this particular metric and it means, it could mean good things or it can mean bad things. And we have to decide, well, what does it mean? <laughs> and what should it mean? And what is this audience that we're talking to? And what do they want it to mean? And how do you then, eat, like first level is how do you inspire investors to decide, hey, this is, this is interesting. This is new. This is something that's like, has never been seen before and has a lot of potential. So like there's that story and also the specific story of, and then how does it turn my whatever, you know, million bucks into 10 million or hundred million bucks. Like there's a whole financial story you have to be able to tell. Um, and then internal to a company, uh, this, this role is not like, I think we should go do this. Is that a good idea? Cool. Let's go do that. Like the, the role is how do you inspire a team of really talented people to, to put their blood, sweat, and tears into a thing and see the potential. Um, and that's another story about vision, about what's coming, about what, how we can impact the world that also needs to be founded in reality. You, you need to be able to say like, hey, I'm seeing this in the market and I'm seeing this in like what our competitors are doing. And like, we could do this. And isn't that amazing? And, and, and those stories also need buy-in. You need to be able to involve people and say, hey, what do you think we should do? And, and when it's a group of 20 people, there's, there's 20 different ideas in the room or, you know, a hundred different ideas in the room. Uh, and you can't just, you can't just say, okay, well, we'll do all of them. Like you, you, you need to be able to take a bunch of opinions and, and come back and say, Hey, I'm going, to, I, I'm, this is my, my route through this. This is why we're going in this direction. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you and this is how you're being listened to. 
And also this is, you know, I, I'm not just, just taking a poll and doing whatever the poll says. Like I, like we need to show that I, I there's leadership there. Um, and so that's this other layer of storytelling where it's like storytelling in a group. Uh, so the idea that like, I don't know. I, I came into this just playing around with flashcards. <laughs> I came into this being like, "Hey, I have a. I found a way to learn things faster, and I'm going to make some flashcard decks. And I guess I can hire some people to make those flashcard decks faster." Um, and over the last few years, it's transformed into this this really weird, like like, "Hey, I let's all tell stories together, and and change the world based on how those stories are told." Uh, that wasn't what I predicted um the amount of importance and effort that was put into like like completely unrelated things to product like like culture building how do you get 20 people to who are all remote all over the world i mean we're in 10 time zones how do you get those people to like each other to want to work together to have uh good relationships good working relationships such that they can have conflict and say hey i disagree with you on this but not screw up the relationship and not become toxic but instead like get closer as a result of each of those conflicts. Um, how do you tell people how to behave uh, in like completely unnatural ways? Like we have, you know, uh, we decided on, on, in terms of our company culture that, that we would like have degrees of uh, uh, responsiveness. Like if someone sends you an email, you need to like send, send someone right back and be like, Hey, I got it. I'll get to you. I'll get to you tomorrow. Or like things like being direct where you're like, Hey, I don't like your opinion here. Like you don't say that to people. Uh, that's not a thing. Like, like we're told not to be direct. Like that, we're all we're all uh, grow, we've grown up to not be direct. When someone says something that was kind of like you think it was kind of stupid, you don't say, "Hey, that was a stupid thing," or like, "I disagree," and like, "I I don't understand why you would even say that." Um, but in in this weird context of hey, we we're all deciding that we're going to. We're going to follow these these new cultural norms that we just invented, you know, in 2018. Um, we we built a group of people where we're like, hey, I, I know you don't want to be direct. I know none of us want to be direct in that way, but like, I need you to tell me when I'm being dumb. <laughs> I need all of you to tell me when I'm being dumb, and I need all of you to tell each other when you're being dumb. When you're making a decision that you don't agree with, I need you to open your mouth and say, this is a bad decision. I think it for the following reasons. Um, like these are all strange ways of interacting with people. And the, the idea that, that part of my role, instead of just like, Hey, I want to go do this. I'm going to make some flashcards. And can you help me make some flashcards is, Hey, I want to, I want to architect how we all interact <laughs> and, and make sure that we do it and make sure we all believe that this is a good idea and, and stuff. Like these are, these are really strange aspects of this job. Um, that have proven to be really rewarding and proven to be really exciting and like have, have made it an amazing place to work for a while. Um, but also like it, if, if certainly when, when we were talking last, the, I, I wouldn't have imagined that that's what this job was. So yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's a complete answer to your question, but that's, that's part of it. <laughs> No, that was great. Thank you for going so in depth with that. And I think it's just really interesting to hear because I think, you know, for a lot of people, when they become passionate about something like your passion for language learning and teaching other people how to learn languages, it's sometimes we don't think about like what goes in on the business side in order to actually like get what we're doing out to people. And obviously you have a lot of, you know, business experience through prior work and and whatnot and releasing a book and with the first stages of Fluent Forever. But I just feel like everything you're talking about just feels like, you know, like a level higher, like managing a team, you know, hiring programmers, figuring out how to keep people excited about your vision, et cetera, et cetera. So definitely an interesting process to hear about. And something I'd love to dive into a little bit is talking a little bit about the method that you guys use for, for language learning. Um, for those people who maybe didn't listen to the first interview or aren't super familiar with Fluent Forever, can you just walk us through like what the method is for taking people to fluency? So I think there's sort of two ways to look at the method. Um, one of those is just, well, what do you do? And then another one is like, why? And I think they're both kind of important. So on the like, what do you do front? Um, the rough arc is you spend some time with pronunciation and ear training at first. Uh, you do that because there's an example I usually jump to with Hungarian where I'm like, okay, the Hungarian word for camera is finikip ezugip. 
And if you don't have familiarity with Hungarian, you've already forgotten the word that I said like 10 seconds ago. <laughs> and that happens because you're not familiar with the sounds in that language. And so your, your ears filter it out. <clears throat> they tell you that, I don't know, that's foreign, some whatever. <laughs> uh, that guy said, and that's fine. He said some, some word that started with F. Uh, and the only reason you're holding on to the F part is because like, for one, it's the beginning of the word and two, like you have that F <laughs> that's the one sound that actually you do, you do keep. And so, uh, like you have from English and so that one you retain, but everything else is garbage. And so if you're trying to learn a language where your ear is actively fighting, you is telling you, well, that's just garbage. I don't, I don't want that. Uh, then you're going to have a hard time remembering anything. So you need to start with ear training. Uh, there's a quick kind of fix for ear training. It's a, you practice telling the difference between similar sounding words like doman toma in Spanish, the DNT. Um, and then you just get quizzed on them at random. If you, if you get it wrong, it tells you you're wrong. If you get it right, it tells you you're right. And that kind of process rewires your ears within about two, three weeks. Um, and so that first like two to four weeks or so is you engaging with the ear training in that language and then also learning the spelling system. Um, cause like if you're trying to learn French and every, you're like, why are these random letters sitting here? This doesn't make any sense. Then you're going to have a hard time remembering the spelling of any word. And then that's also going to prevent your, your ability to recall words. Um, once you pass that first two to four week period where you've kind of gotten the sound system down, then you're positioned to actually remember some words. Um, at that point now you're like, if I were to tell you, you know, the Martian word for cameras, mognog. Like you can hold on to that and and that's that's manageable. Now you're now you're on like somewhat stable footing. Um and because sounds are familiar and spellings are still, you know, M-O-G, N-O-G, Mognog. We're we're cool. Um so once you're at that Mognog phase, you know, the, the this is comfortable phase, um, then you start being able to actually retain words. And then it becomes this question of, well, uh, how do we want to do, how do we want to hold on to words? Um, and that is kind of much of the rest of the game here. Um, at this point, you're, you're, you're trying to build foundations where you have vocabulary that, that has the right kinds of connections in it. So what I mean by that is when I said, you know, if gape is, you gapes the word for camera in that case, like I've actually told you nothing of value, uh, camera, connects to all the cameras you've seen in your life for any of the English speakers in this audience. I mean, basically anyone who can understand me at the rate of speed that I'm speaking uh, for them, camera is, is connected to all the cameras you've seen in your life. It's connected to words like shutter and lens and iPhone, all that's built into camera. It's connected to like uh, verbs, like to take a picture, things like that. Like that's connected to camera. Uh, any, you know, you're old, like whatever, if you, if you've gotten married, like wedding photographer is connected to camera and literally the album that you got is connected to camera. So like all of that is inside of camera and none of that is inside of Finn Gabe as you gave. Um, and so you, you need to fix that problem. You need to have associations with these new words that actually, that mean something that aren't just trying to copy something that you built with camera. Um, and so the way you start building those associations is with, um, is with imagery. Uh, our brains are lazy. Um, when I tell you that, you know, Mognog is the word for camera, you don't actually think about this device that has a button that clicks a shutter that, that takes a picture that produces photos. Like what you think is, okay, Mognog camera, Mognog camera. You're trying to memorize the sound of those two words, um, and connect the sounds of those two words. Um, but the moment that you you search Google images, let's say, and let's say we're learning the Hungarian word for dog, kutya. And so you, 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 you put in kutya into Google images and you see all these breeds of dogs that you didn't expect to see because Hungarians, when they blog about dogs, they choose different breeds on average than Americans do because they're different dogs that are popular there. And so suddenly when you look at that and you, you spot those differences and you're like, Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's more or less a dog, but, but not quite like that's, that's a kutyo and, and huh, look at, look at what's popular there. Um, at that point, now you've learned something new. You've built new associations like this now interaction you've had with Google images, let's say in this case, um, that's taught you what the word means. Not, it's not taught you about the word, like this translation thing has taught you what it really means. And so 
that's the moment that you learned what it meant. Um, you can have that moment on Google. You can have that moment with a native speaker when you're talking to them and being like, Hey, like, like I, I have a, like my, there's Norbert under my bed. Like he, he goes like rough, rough. And they're like, Oh, is it Cucho? And you're like, oh, what? <laughs> Cucho. Norbert is it Cucho? And you're like, Oh, okay, cool. So Norbert, okay, cool. Now I'm making this connection between this, this, this dog that's actually under my desk and this Cucho concept. Okay. That's the moment I learned the word. And so the, the next step in terms of, of building, once you have that pronunciation step down is how do I, how do I collect a whole bunch of words and start building like real associations into them? And then how do I hold on to those associations later? And so the hold on to it later part is flashcards for me. Uh, that's flashcards end up just being a fancy way to test yourself and testing yourself is what ingrains memories. Um, and my learning process is building those flashcards is, well, what do I put on the front of those flashcards in the back? Uh, and so if I'm learning simple words, uh, then I will literally say, okay, Kutyo, and I'm going to take a picture of my dog Norbert, or I'm going to go on Google images and see what all the Hungarians choose for that word. Um, if I'm learning, uh, abstract words like, uh, prepositions, things like that, verbs, all this, all the, you know, the meat of the language, um, then it's going to be, uh, fill in the blank sentences next to images. Uh, and so that's kind of how you start holding on to the, 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 the nice parts of the language, the parts of the language that glue it together and actually let you think in the language. So uh, an example would be like, if, if I'm learning English, I'm learning the preposition by, like I'm standing by the bus. Um, well, what does by look like? It's abstract. It doesn't look like anything, but uh, in the context of I'm standing by the bus, it's the thing that lets me tell that story. And so I'm standing blank the bus next to a picture of a bus stop, next to a picture of me standing by a bus, like next, next to all sorts of imagery that I can come, uh, come up with for that particular story. That's what by looks like. Um, and so the sort of the main body of, of the language learning experience for me is let's start filling everything in, like let's start building all these flashcards. Let's have some strategy with it. So I'm not just building flashcards at random. I actually have a, a word list that I like to go through um, that, that covers all these most frequent words. And I, I, I like to go through that in that particular, in the order that it's presented. Um, but I will go and say, hey, like today we're going to learn the word one. And we're going to come up with a personal sentence that has to do with one. And we're going to put that into flashcard form. And that's how I'm going to learn it first. And then I'm going to see that flashcard tomorrow. And then I'm going to see that flashcard in four days. And I'm going to see that flashcard in 10 days. And then I'm going to see that flashcard in 20 days. Uh, and so, and, and every time I test myself, it's going to help me ingrain that, that first moment of me learning that word. Um, and so that kind of builds me out to having like a solid vocabulary and a solid intuitive understanding of grammar. Um, cause I'm, I'm, I'm learning sentences and that's how our, our brains kind of, they learn grammar on their own really. Um, and then at the at sort of end stage, uh, once I've, I've kind of had this rhythm and I'm, I'm pulling in all these sentences into my head and all these, these words in my head, um, then I can start specializing and saying, well, what do I want out of this language? Um, is this a language I just kind of want a little bit of familiarity with so I can kind of bounce around and say some, say some basic stuff, or do I want to hit like, you know, college level in this language? And so then I need to get, you know, comprehensive, really good grammar. And so I'm going to go pull out my grammar book and fill in any holes I'm missing. Uh, or do I want to specialize in like food? You know, do I want to be able to go to any restaurant in Japan and like order all the things then I'm going to pull out the menus and like, be like, okay, I want to be able to or order in this ramen restaurant in the sushi restaurant and the, whatever, all these, all these restaurants. Um, and so I'll, I'll start doing really themed vocabulary study, uh, so that I get good at that or like, TV stuff. And I'll start focusing on, you know, anime vocabulary so that I could look at the, my favorite anime shows. Um, so there's a bunch of like specialization stuff that happens at the end where I'm, I'm starting to kind of customize the language to what I need it to be. Uh, but the, the central part is this idea of learning through the process of building flashcards that can remind me about the learning experience. It's kind of this, this, I don't know, virtuous circle thing. So that's, that's the, the, I don't know. I feel like it's a, it's a, the method in abstract, but also the method in a little bit concrete, but, but I'm like, I'm trying to fit a, a six to 12 to 24 month process into like a few minutes of talking about it. But like, that's, that's kind of what it looks like. Yeah. And I think that, that like core insight of building connections to the actual thing, as opposed to getting stuck in the translation or 
the English word was such a huge thing for us when we read your book back in the day was just that so much of the the way people were learning languages then. And I think it's improved a little bit, but still today is just like pure translation, which is helpful for a tiny bit, like especially at the start, but no one who actually speaks a language does it translating and people have this experience of like, oh, I've you know been on Duolingo for X long, but then I go and I start trying to talk to people and I just like get completely stuck uh, and can't do anything about it. So that idea of like, no, you need to actually like train your brain to associate the new words with the actual things in reality, as opposed to the abstract concept. And then you end up not speaking like English using Spanish words, but actually speaking Spanish. I mean, there's, there's a really interesting thing that happens when you go to like full-blown immersion programs where um, like the, the one, the first place I actually successfully learned a language. Like I, I did the thing that everyone did of floundering for 12 years and not getting anywhere. Um, but the first time I really learned a language was in Middlebury, Vermont. They have the immersion programs there that are amazing. And, and everyone only speaks the target language and, and it's forbidden to speak English and all this stuff. And everyone that I'm aware of, like everyone I was talking to, like started dreaming in the language by about the second week. And like I had, in my case, I had no exposure to German before. And that was my first one was German. And, and in two weeks, I'm dreaming in German. And now the dreams are stupid. They're not good dreams. I'm just like, this is blue. That's also blue. Like just the worst dream ever. But nonetheless, I'm, I'm, I'm able to think and dream in a new language. And people believe that this is a thing that can only happen after, you know, years of, of, of translating. And like, there isn't a, a clear path from I translate stuff and then I think in the language. Like, I feel like the, the idea of I'm going to practice translating stuff uh, hey, translation is really hard. Like it's why the, the, it's why if you if you have a simultaneous translator, someone who's able to just I'm talking and the other person is immediately like just saying things that I'm saying in the new language, like that person is paid like two fifty to four hundred an hour because that job is so hard. And the idea that you could just practice translating and if you just practice enough, eventually you become a simultaneous translator. Like no, like that's a specialist job. That's a job for someone who's brilliant and, and talented and has already hit fluency and is able to think in both languages just fine. And then on top of that has learned this translation skill. And, and so like there's this, that's, that's years of work to become that person, uh, many years of work and talent. Whereas if it's the case that like everyone who shows up to this immersion program is starting to dream in, in, in German or in whatever language that they're targeting within a couple of weeks, like that's what we're actually capable of. There's no reason why you can't practice thinking in a language in the first day. And if that's what we're able to do, like why, why try to do this other task first? Like why not just focus on, okay, well, let's just practice thinking in the language and let's think about some dumb things that are easy and eventually build up to more complicated things. But the whole way through, let's just keep thinking in that language. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's so cool to hear that people are dreaming in another language like so soon. It's definitely like shows that they're actually like picking up these words and stuff like that. And so I know we've talked about a couple things already with this, but I'm curious, you know, your thoughts on what most people get wrong about language learning. And I know we talked about like, like that kind of idea of just purely translating things, but you know, on top of that, what are some other things that people kind of in general, if they're not doing kind of the fluent forever method, what are they doing? Maybe wrong is not the, the best word, but doing that are slowing them down in the process of learning a language. Um, I think that the, one of the most common ones is this idea of learning words in uh, categories. Um, books tend like language books, language classes, all this stuff, they tend to present words as Let's learn all the colors today. Now let's learn all the professions. Now let's learn all of the you know fruits, whatever. There's two issues with that approach. I get why people do the approach. I get why why it's presented that way because it feels really satisfying, and, and that it's important for things to feel satisfying. You don't want to just hit a bunch of random words and be like, "This feels like endless." Jesus, like I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and the idea of being like, you know, to this week I'm going to focus on colors and I'm going to learn all my colors. The end. I did it. Check. Check, put the check mark on it. Like I've accomplished colors. I've accomplished fruits, all this stuff that, that feels good. Um, but the things that go wrong with that or that slow you down are there's, there's two of them. One, you're learning a bunch of words that are kind of necessarily really low frequency. They don't show up very often. So like when you're learning members of the family, uh, I believe the word like mother is used about like more than 50 times more often than the word niece. 
Um, and so why are you learning niece? Unless you have a niece that you want to talk about that, like you're really passionate about, like, this is my niece. And like, I just, everyone should know about my niece. I, I spend all these hours of my niece every week. Like this is my niece. Like in that case, you use niece plenty often. And so you should learn niece, but for someone who doesn't even have a niece, why are you learning that word anytime in the earlier parts of your language learning process when you could learn a word that is worth 50 nieces, mother, uh, and, and then graduate to another word that, that is also as common as mother. And so whenever you're learning, like, I'm going to learn all the family members, you're spending most of your time focused on words that you're maybe never going to use. Um, like, I, I never talk about apricots. I don't even need that word. <laughs> Uh, and I certainly don't need that word in another language. Like, why should I go through and learn all the fruits? Why shouldn't I just learn like two of them? And then, and then if I'm like struggling and I'm like, Hey, what I could ask, what fruit is this? And they could be like, it's a blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, Oh, I don't even know what that is. Can I look it up on Wikipedia? Like, that's enough. That's all I needed really is just to be able to talk about fruit and maybe like yellow fruit. So that sort of chunk one is that when, when you, when you're off in terms of when you're spending your time learning low frequency words, you're kind of wasting your time and you're wasting a lot of time. There's, there's, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 words that you could be learning and, and, and you're focusing on the ones that you're almost never going to use. Um, the other one is a lot more insidious uh, and is, has to do with how we store memories. Um, we store them partly based on category and we store them partly based on time. And so when I learn red and green and yellow and all the colors, you know, uh, on Wednesday, and then now it's a, a week later or six days later, I'm on Tuesday, the, week, the next week. And, I, and someone shows me a thing and I'm like, oh, that's, uh, and I'm looking for the word for red. My, I go back in my brain. I'm like, okay, so red is one of the colors. Okay. Now I have a list of a whole bunch of colors in my head. And I'm like, okay, no, 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 not all those colors. It's the color I learned last Wednesday. Crap. I learned all my colors last Wednesday. And so you, all of the other colors interfere and they prevent you from remembering the word red. And this has been measured in terms of how, how impactful this is. And it's unfortunately like really impactful. Um, you're, you're the, if you learn all of your colors on one day and you compare that to another student who learns their colors on different days, um, your recall rate is 50% of that other student. You, you hold on to that word half as long. Also, the amount of time you spent on that first Wednesday is twice as long. So the learning speed is half and the recall rate is half. And that's what you get when you do categories. Brutal. Uh, and so when you take that and you compare it to something like, you know, having just random words is uncomfortable, but, but works twice as well. Um, there's one step that's a little better, which is, hey, instead of learning, you know, red and green and yellow on the same day, you learn like red and apple and delicious on the same day. Uh, and then those words get a little bit more associated and they, they stick a little better. And it feels like I learned a thing <laughs> instead of just, I learned some random stuff. It's like, that's, that's one huge pitfall that I think almost everyone falls into. Um, I think the idea of trying to like push pronunciation at your training later in the language learning process uh, has the memory stuff that I already talked about earlier, but also has this effect of I'm going to practice with a bad accent for years. And then I'm going to try to convince my tongue to go do something that it hasn't done for three years. I've, I've said, you know, the word, uh, you know, is, but instead I've said ease and I've practiced saying ease, uh, this, this is good. And then I've done that 50,000 times over three years. And suddenly I'm like, oh, it's is. Okay. Let me try to unlearn three years of bad habits. Um, and so I think in terms of the ordering of like, when are you doing which part? The idea of pronunciation earlier on allows you to kind of skip this unlearning about habits part in addition to all the memory effects that you have. Um, and I guess the last chunk is, um, is grammar. I think people look at language learning and I think because grammar study was like a thing that was hard in school, there's a feeling of, well, I'm learning a language, I better do my grammar. Um, I better learn, you know, how does, how does the subjunctive work? Like I better learn all these pieces. That's what learning a language is. Um, but like when you learned your first language, no one sat you down and taught you about the subjunctive or the you know present continuous or something like that. They just, you know, put a cookie in front of you and like, hey, you want the cookie? <laughs> like that's that's how you learned grammar. And if that's the case, like 
why spend your time focused on grammar lessons as your main type of study rather than like cookies that you want <laughs> rather than learning sentences that, that tell stories that you want to be able to tell or allow you to get things that you want to be able to get. Uh, and so I, I think there is a, there's a role for grammar. Grammar is important. I like grammar and particularly like, I think for people who are really into grammar, they're like, Oh, this is cool. I like seeing all the pieces of this puzzle. Like for those people, they absolutely should learn how's that subjunctive work? Like, how does it work? How does, how do the, the irregulars work? Like, let's learn all these little pieces. But I think learning them after you've already learned some examples, uh, because they're examples that you wanted to talk about, allows you to hold on to those grammar lessons a lot faster. So if, I, if I'm learning Spanish and I've already talked about, you know, myself and like, I eat this and I eat that. And I like, I, I like to, I, I drank this drink yesterday and I, I learned the past tense and that of, of, I did that. And I gave my dog, you know, his, his snacks today. And, and so I, I have all these experiences of talking about things in the first person. Um, I have these experiences of talking about my dog in the third person or my, my wife or the third person that like, she did this and she's, she's doing this today and all this stuff. Um, and my, my dog, I let my dog out. My dog ran around the, 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 the lawn. Now I have the first person and the third person. And maybe I have some more experience with like a little less experience, but, but still a fair bit of experience with like the third person plural, because I have some friends and they're all doing this stuff and, and they did some stuff and I did some stuff with my friends last week and all those things. Then I can look at a conjugation chart after I've learned all those sentences and I can say, hey, you know what? I don't have a lot of experience with the plural you, or I haven't used we very much. And, but I kind of know three of these six conjugations already. I I've, I've have you know, 50 examples of first person singular, and I have probably like 40 examples of third person singular, but like, I probably only have like a few plural use and look at that, look at that pattern. Isn't that interesting? Um, when I'm learning in that way, those, those new patterns, when I look at the, the grammar chart, the conjugation charts, they're much more memorable because I can connect them to things I've already learned. Whereas if I don't have any example sentences and I just rush into a grammar book and I crack open page one on my first day of a language and I'm like, okay, here's a chart. Like charts are not very memorable and they don't mean very much. Um, and so I think playing around with order in that way of saying, hey, let's, you know, let's do pronunciation first. Let's get some example sentences first and then let's play with grammar and then let's start exploring. Um, I think can, can get you and, and this order of words, you know, when am I going to learn mother and when am I going to learn niece and, and am I going to learn them on the same day or not? Um, optimizing order can give you a lot more speed. Uh, and I think those pieces tend to be overlooked. There's a sense of order, whatever, like, let me just make sure I'm doing some stuff. Um, so I would say those are, those are the ones that come to mind. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all of those. And I feel like I resonate with so much of what you were talking about. As you said, the word for niece, I turned to Ryan and I was like, what's the Spanish word for niece? Like we don't have any nieces. And after he said it, I was like, oh yeah, okay. I, I knew that it was somewhere in my brain, but it's like, you know, I probably learned it on Duolingo or something like that. Exactly what you're talking about, but have, I just don't use that word because I'm never talking about a niece. And then similarly, when you were talking about like the different uses of like, you know, you, I, we, it's been interesting, like having a baby over the last couple of months, because using like, like she is, or she was, is something that I just rarely used in Spanish prior to having a baby. And so now I'm learning like all these conjugations for these different verbs with the like he, she formal you form of Spanish and, you know, the, I, the, you, and the, the, we was like, you know, basically all I used when talking about my life or talking with other people in Spanish up until having a baby. So it is interesting that to hear you talk about that. Cause I feel like that's very much been related to like my personal experience with language learning. Sure. I remember um, I, when I learned Russian, I learned it exclusively with a frequency list. So just, I learned the top thousand words of Russian and then showed up in immersion program like six months later. And they, uh, they, they had an entrance exam where they had like a, an entrance placement exam where they, they had me fill out essays basically as, a, as part of the thing. And the first essay was like, Hey, you're going to the store. What are you going to buy? 
And I just floundered with that one. Like this was supposed to be the easy one. And they're like, give us a shopping list basically. And I'm like, and the only words I knew were like, uh, I'm going to, I wrote this essay of, I'm going to go to the store for this party and I'm going to buy vodka, which is the one like in the top thousand words in Russian, you have vodka, bread, and meat. <laughs> that was it. And I'm like, okay, I have three things for this list. And so I'm just going to have to inflate it. I'm going to get vodka, lots of vodka. And then I'm going to get some bread and I'm going to get some meat, so much meat. It's going to be such a good party with this bread and meat and the vodka, the vodka, bread, and meat. I just had this, I had to ramble awful, awful essay. And I'm like, oh crap. Um, and then the second essay was like, Hey, tell me about your day. Like, tell me about how your last week went. And I'm like, okay, I can talk about that. Like, I have enough words for that. I, you know, I, I flew on this plane. Like, these are words I have. Uh, and I flew all the way to Vermont and Vermont was really, really, really cool. And like, and then I went into the country. I had all these words to talk about that. And then the final essay was supposed to like really trip you up. They're like, talk about uh, the idea of scaling teacher pay to the grades of their students. And I wrote this, like, I, I didn't, I was new to Russian more or less, but I had learned these top thousand words. And I, I had this four page essay I wrote about like the inequality and unfairness of, of like doing this, this kind of teacher paid scaling to, to like scaling salaries over to, to student grades, because I had all the words for it, because that's what people talk about. They talk about things that are frequent. That's, that's why they're frequent. Um, and so I found that I, I, was, I was handicapped every time someone asked me to do something that was supposed to be basic. And I had all the skills I needed whenever someone wanted me to do something that was theoretically complicated. And, and then I showed up in like the cafeteria and I realized like, I don't know the word for fork. <laughs> I don't know the word for any of these utensils, but I do know enough words to be like, Hey, can you hand me that like metal thing? <laughs> and, and as soon as I was like, what, you mean the fork? And I'm like, yeah, fork. Cool. Uh, I, I had enough connections because I, because I had built all those words in like real ways. I wasn't just learning translations. Um, I, I could learn things like fork really quickly. Uh, Cause when I, I think one of the things that is, I don't know if it's not obvious or just like you don't quite get a feel for it. Your, your learning speed increases over time. The more words you have, the faster you can learn new words. So the idea of picking up niece late in your language learning process is actually like you could pick that, that, that up in an instant where in the beginning you, you have so few foundations that picking up a new word is really costly. It, it takes a lot of work. Uh, and so spending that work on like really frequent stuff allows you to kind of pick up the, the extra pieces, the forks and the spoons uh, really, really quickly later on. And, and fill in the gaps really easily, uh, where it's a lot harder in the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a ton of sense. Um, and Gabriel, I'm just curious about your own language learning over the, the past number of years. What's that looked like? Have you been learning any new languages? How do you maintain the different languages that you do know? So I, when, in 2015, I would have just finished Hungarian, um, and I would have probably just started Japanese. Uh, and like a lot of my language learning has been I learn languages for weird reasons. Like I don't, I don't learn them to talk to people. Like I, I it's, I, I test them on by talking to people, but I'm not like, man, I really want to converse with all sorts of people. I'm kind of an introvert, but I, I like seeing, seeing what my brain can do. Like it's a fun puzzle for me. Uh, I like thinking in these new ways. I like meeting myself in these new, like for me, language, speaking a new language is kind of an altered state. And I like kind of exploring these, these different parts of my personality. Um, and I remember people basically talking about Japanese as like, man, this thing's impossible. I, I think this, you know, your method might be one piece of it, but man, it's not the whole thing. Like Japanese is too hard for you. Like you're, this isn't, this method isn't going to work for it. And I'm like, well, let me find out. I want to find out. Um, and so I started Japanese, uh, started modifying my method to deal with it. Um, and, and yeah, it is a hard language. Um, then I, I met my now wife uh, and her uh She's bicultural. She's, she's, her family's from Mexico. Uh, eventually, when we were about to get married, she's like, Gabe, you're a language person. The idea that you don't speak Spanish is not acceptable. <laughs> you have to fix this. And I'd been avoiding Spanish for a long time because uh, I was like, well, like, everyone learns Spanish. Like, why learn Spanish? Like, it's close enough to Italian. This isn't going to give me a new experience uh, in terms of a new problem to solve. Um, but that was not important. My wife was like, no, you're going to learn Spanish. So I did. Um, so I, I put my Japanese stuff on hold. I learned Spanish, um, got it to like, like B1, B2 fluency, um, over, I want to say about a 12 month span. Um, and then I went back and, uh, worked on, on Japanese actually again, uh, and kind of on and off with Japanese. There've been a lot of experiments of being like, well, what if I did Japanese in VR? Like, would that be better or worse or different? Um, 
Japanese has been kind of a big test language for me for a while, and it will probably continue to be. Um, I, I want that language to reach a really, really high level of fluency, ideally my best language. Um, and also it's like, it's four times harder than, than Spanish and like, you know, twice as hard as Russian. Like it's, it's Japanese is a brutal, brutal language. And so it's, it's going to take me a while. Um, so those have been, that's sort of been my, my stuff in over the last seven years has really been a focus on Japanese with a little, a, a stopover in Spanish. Um, in terms of maintenance, I, I tend to not maintain my languages very much, uh, unless I see like, oh God, I need to go demonstrate them. Um, there was a moment where it seemed like we might go on Shark Tank. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, now I need to have all of them fresh. And so I was taking like six tutoring sessions a week where I would just alternate languages, every single one of them. Uh, and that brought them all back and was like, okay, wait, okay, yeah, I can talk again. Um, there were certainly moments where I'm like jumping in my Italian tutoring thing and it's basically Spanish. <laughs> and they're like, dude, this isn't Italian, fix it. Uh, and, and vice versa. Um, so like maintaining a whole bunch of languages is is work. I mean, I, I remember there's um, one of the polyglots out there, Alexander Agui, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, like he has 12 languages under his belt and like has a like hours of, of daily study to keep them all active. Uh, I, I don't have that. I don't, I don't need them all to be active. I need to be able to bring them back. And so on that front, I know how to bring them back. I just, I, I watch a bunch of TV and I jump into a bunch of tutoring sessions and they, they come back. Uh, and so I just kind of let them kind of go fallow uh, and, and degrade. And then when I need them back, I pull them back. Yeah. And one more question. How do you kind of apply your method to learning languages that have different scripts? Like how do you go about learning Japanese characters or for Russian, obviously different, um, different characters as well. How do you kind of apply like the lessons you've learned into actually like learning to read and, and write in those languages? So I, I hold that in the pronunciation phase in the beginning. For me, pronunciation is a, max, a mixture of, of ear training, but also spelling. And for French, the spelling happens to be a bunch of letters that I'm familiar with, but in weird orders. Um, but for Russian, it tends to be a bunch of new letters. Um, there is, there's a couple like slight modifications to the flashcards in terms of that, of being like, hey, what's, what's this letter as opposed to how do you spell this word? So it's, it's a little more narrow and, and, and directed to one particular part of the word instead of the whole word. Um, but that's how I handle sort of new alphabets. Um, in Japanese's case, uh, like in Chinese's case, like these are sort of the only two that are dealing with logograms where um, you have characters that represent whole words or whole concepts rather than pronunciation. Um, and in Japanese has both actually, they have new, new symbols for sounds and they have new symbols for words and they mix them back and forth. Um, and that's why Japanese is so brutal, frankly, uh, for English speakers. It's that it's, it's a whole other layer of data that's stored on top of every single word in the language. Um, for that stuff, it depends on what your goals are. Um, in, in my case, I don't want to be able to write Japanese, but I do want to be able to read it. Uh, so if someone were to ask me about, you know, how do you, how do you write this particular thing that's complicated? Um, I probably won't be able to generate it on the fly. Uh, but if someone asked me to read it, then I would. And so I have a, a set of flashcards that also is just like, hey, here's the thing. Here's the character. What's the word? And give me, think, think of an example sentence that has this word in it. And that sort of trains me to recognize these things. Um, there's a piece in there about if I wanted to build the ability to write, um, I would really focus on memorizing uh, the radicals, the pieces inside of each character, um, which is to say, like when, when you say, you know, uh, Apple in English. Uh, you don't, you don't think, okay, well, capital A. So that's a, you know, that's a stroke from the bottom left to the top middle, and then a stroke from the top middle down to the bottom, right. And then a stroke right in the middle across, like, you don't think Apple is made of, of those three strokes. And then a stroke down for the P like, you don't have this story. You're like, no, it's a P P L E <laughs> you've the word, the letter a is associated with this three stroke letter thing. And also with this round thing with the line next to it, that is the lowercase a, like that's a for you. You spent some time memorizing that, and then it became a single concept instead of a bunch of lines. Um, so same deal with, with any of these alphabet systems, stuff like that. With, with, uh, you have to kind of match this, this set of lines with this sound, and then suddenly there, there's a chunk, and you're fine. You, you can handle it. Um, and same deal even with the Japanese characters and Chinese characters, where they're, they're more complicated. Um, they have a chunk of you know three or four lines, and that's this thing, and it means you know strength, and it it, it shows up in thousands of characters. And so if this character is like strength, and there next to it is another sort of 
concepty chunk, then you don't have to memorize, okay, line, 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 line. You're just like, okay, that's strength and tree. Cool. Strength tree. Uh, and so if you start memorizing these chunks, it allows you to hold on to the more complicated things like the bigger characters. So that ends up being the route through those is, is learning those pieces and then starting to build like stories. You're like, oh, forest, that's three trees in a row. Cool. Now I, now I remember what, how, to, how to write forest. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And then I know we're bumping up on time, um, but I am curious for you, if, if we were to say like, okay, we're going to like delete from your memory, all your languages, except for one other than English, um, what would you keep? What, what's like your favorite um, non-English language you've learned to speak? Oh, that's mean. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's going to be between Japanese and, and German. Uh, I you know, I would keep Japanese. Uh, I've put so much work into Japanese. I want to keep it. Um, I, German is my best language by far. Cause I lived there, all that stuff. The idea of losing all of that would be tragic, but also like, I haven't gotten to just learn a language for fun in a while. And like, it's always been kind of work related stuff like that. The idea of being like, Hey, start German over Th there's something appealing about that. Uh, and so I, I guess I will go with keeping Japanese, but that's a, that's a rough, rough question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thankfully, only a hypothetical. Um, awesome, Gabriel. Well, it's been awesome catching up and, and talking more about language learning. I know for, for Amanda and I, just spending so much time in Latin America, we've been kind of on this continuous journey to get better and better at Spanish um, and kind of reaching new points now with the baby. So uh, it's always fun and definitely used a lot of the ideas that, that we found in your book and I used your flashcards and the app. So uh, it's awesome to be able to, to catch up. And for people who are interested in learning languages, maybe kind of early on in the journeys or wherever they might be, um, what's the best way for them to like start using Fluent Forever? Um, and is there anything else you'd like to let people know about? Um, I mean, the anyone who's new should be trying out our like the first 14 days of our app. It's free, like, and it 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 teaches you all of the lessons of how to be a good learner. And so it's like a no brainer. You should go do that thing. Um, also it'll teach you all the, like the pronunciation system of a language. Uh, and within those two weeks, if you put in a decent amount of time, like you can get through all that material within the two weeks. So like that trial thing, like just do the trial thing. It's like you become a better learner by the end of it and you can just cancel the thing and you're done. Like, great. Uh, and so do that thing for sure. Um, for the folks who are like, I have a big goal, like I'm moving to Mexico or I'm moving somewhere and I need to fix this thing. Um, start with the app anyway, like those first 14 days, just do it period. But um, the coaching things that we've been doing lately, uh, they are just remarkable. Uh, and so if you have a real need, the idea of having a coach who you chat to chat with on a weekly basis or a daily basis, even, and then all of that content with the coach gets dumped into the app so that you can remember it later. Uh, that combo is amazing. It's just luxurious and stupidly good. Uh, I, I don't talk about my app in this way. Like I don't, uh, my app is good. That thing is great. Uh, and so for people who really, really have need and, and, and are able to put some, some money and time into the thing and just are like, I, I need to get this done. Give me, give me a way to get this done. Uh, those coaching things are just remarkable. Um, and so up until January, it was only available in Spanish, but at this point we're in like 13 languages, like it's, it's going, uh, so yeah, for folks who have the need, uh, the coaching stuff is the way to go. Um, and you'll, you'll find that if you go to fluent forever, fluent dash forever.com, uh, up in the top, we have a products area and you can just go to coaching. And that, that thing is just, I, I, I can't say enough about it. I just, I love the thing. Awesome. So yeah, download the app fluentforever.com to check out the coaching. Um, perfect. Well, it's been so awesome catching up, Gib. Likewise. This is this is fun. It's I've I've never done a seven year like comeback thing. This is neat. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we'll chat with you again in less than seven years. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much yeah. for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you want more, make sure to check out the World Wanderers Insider, available on Patreon at patreon.com slash theworldwanderers. For show notes, head over to theworldwanderers.com. Find us on social media at the World Wanderers Podcast and join the private Facebook community at World Wanderers, a community for travelers. You can always get in touch with us at info at theworldwanderers.com. And if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. It really helps us find new listeners. See you next time.